I once held in my hands an object discovered in Kosovo that, by all appearances, was an ancient ocarina carved from some sort of bone. However, when you blew into it, you were not met with musical notes. Rather, the instrument produced streams of color, pouring out of the finger holes and rising briefly into the air, entwining with each other in all sorts of complex patterns and combining to make new, stunning, vivid colors, which finally vanished back into the ether. All manner of things have happened, are happening now on this planet that we do not understand or even vaguely are aware of occasionally. An artifact hinting at such untold and mysterious forces or events is uncovered, mostly by sheer happenstance. My name is Oliver Percy, OP for short, and I hold commerce in such rare items. The latest acquisition are the most incredible I've ever come across yet, as well as the most dangerous. Who holds them holds unfathomable power. And even as I write this, nefarious forces creep in the night, seeking to steal them away. Should those forces ever succeed, I fear that our world will become yet another forgotten relic. The testicles fell into my lap, so to speak. See, I have code running at all hours, crawling the internet in search of certain phrases, contained in news articles, blogs, forum posts, so forth, that might indicate the existence of an uncanny item. Any hits trigger a logistic regression, which helps determine the likelihood that the source in question is, in fact, discussing an object of rare properties. If the log odds are high enough and statistically significant, I receive an alert prompting me to look at the source with my own eyes. Most of the time such a method of discovery turns up nothing of interest. There are exceptions though, and one day, around three months ago, I came across the following post in the off-topic channel of a small forum centered around adhering to the so-called paleo diet. So I finally got the estate sorted after like a year of dealing with red tape bullshit and racking up ridiculous lawyer bills. As it turns out, my father wasn't as rich as he let on, which is fine, whatever. But he did leave me something weird, which I'm hoping somebody here knows what the fuck it is. I mean, what they are. There are two of them. Picture it. There I am, standing in the bank vault, ready to finally pop open the deposit box, expecting a big wad of cash or something like that, and all I get are these two things. Here, inserted into the text, was a photo of the two severed testes, which I did not initially recognize as such, shorn of the scrotum, looking like misshapen, fleshy eggs. What are they? Does anyone know? I took them to a jeweler, thinking they were some kind of precious stones, even though they feel a little, I don't know, rubbery? The jeweler said he'd never seen anything like it before and doubted they were worth anything. But if they aren't worth anything, why did my old man have them in the safety deposit box? Can anyone help me out here? Thanks, guys. Somebody a few comments into the reply thread had an answer. Dude, those are balls. Like, balls balls. The things below your dick. Upon reading that remark and acknowledging it instantly as the truth, I was prepared to close out the browser and go about other business, however, a lingering sense of curiosity kept me reading on. After all, why indeed would this person's father bequeath him two testicles, held secure in a bank vault, no less? Other commentators wondered the same thing. One suggested that the poster's father was trolling him in death, sending him a message to man up and figure his shit out on his own. Another proposed the theory that the father had murdered someone and the testicles served as a posthumous confession. The third, your dad loved balls. It's as simple as that. Just as I was again losing interest, I saw that the owner of the testicles himself made another post. This is nuts. So I got sick of looking at these fucking balls. It really was like my father was mocking me and decided to just toss them in the trash. The thing is, I couldn't. I just stood there like an idiot, holding these ridiculous balls, one in each hand, and I physically could not throw them away. I wanted to. Like my mind was screaming at me, get rid of them, and then I... I swear to God, they started getting warm in my hands, and I felt weird all up my arms. Tingly. And then I felt really strong. Like I could deadlift a cow or some crazy shit. 
Like, look, I know it sounds insane, but I think there's something going on with these balls. That's why my dad had them locked away. And beyond that, I don't know. What do you guys think? Now, the responses to this were split between people who thought that he was joking and, and those wondering if he wasn't taking some kind of drug to cope with the loss of his father. But I had a different perspective. And there was enough in the story to convince me that those testicles likely had special properties. I created an account on the forum, sent the owner of the item a private message, briefly explaining what I did for a living, and how I was interested in the inspecting of the testicles for myself. If they appeared authentic, I assured him, I was prepared to make an offer to purchase them that I was sure he would find amenable. He responded almost immediately, Please come get these things. If you're not yanking my chain, I hate them, and I want them out of my life. And so, arrangements were made. The young man's name was Flint, and when I arrived at his apartment, he did not look well. He greeted me in the open doorway dressed in a white t-shirt with stains down the front and a pair of athletic shorts. His hair was a tangled mess, and his sunken eyes looked as though they hadn't known rest in several days. Hey man, uh, OP, right? That's me. Uh, may I come in? Yeah, yeah, come in. Uh, come in. I didn't think you'd actually show with these balls. They're the real deal. You know that somehow. It's possible, I said, stepping around a litter of disposable dishes and empty beer bottles. I've certainly seen stranger things. Yeah, me too. Great show. Uh, what, what, are these things from the Upside Down or something? Flint lit a cigarette and started pacing around in a circle. I thought that was all fake, though. He waved a hand in the air, leaving an arc of smoke in his trail. What, you like work for the government or something, man? I had a good-natured laugh, trying to, trying to put the troubled young man at ease. Private sector. As I say, I deal in rare artifacts, buying, selling, studying. Uh, shall we take a look at the items in question? Flint squinted and scrutinized me for a painfully long time until something seemed to click in his head, and he appeared to relax somewhat. Yeah, sure thing. Sure, have a look. He pointed into the kitchen. In there. A cabinet above the stove, wrapped up in tinfoil. Uh, have a look. I'm not going anywhere near them again. I'll, I'll tell you that as a fact, dude. I nodded and made my way into the kitchen, quite on edge myself. I was either dealing with a potential lunatic, or the testicles had the ability to turn you into a lunatic. I had to be very careful. My pocket knife might offer me some protection against the former possibility, if for some reason Flint attempted to attack me, but against the possibility of madness, I had no defense. Is it worth it? I wondered, as I reached up to the cabinet. Should I turn around and go back home? My hand rested on the knob a moment as I considered, and in the end, the same compulsion that got me into my profession in the first place went out. A thirst to discover the unknown. I swung the cabinet door open and spotted the packet of aluminum foil inside. When I touched it, I felt a slight charge of electricity and knew at once that I was dealing with something remarkable. Uh, careful with that shit, cautioned Flint as I set the packet down on the countertop. Hmm, of course, I said, distracted with the excitement of peeling back the tinfoil wrapping. And then, they were there before me. Two severed testicles, looking like nothing more nor less than that. I picked them up and held one in each of my palms. A rush of warmth ran up my arms. You feel that? said Flint. Right. He's weak, I thought. Lives alone, obviously. I could slit his throat. Walk away feeling free. Clear. I fought against the sudden urge to murder, set the testicles back on the foil, and took a deep breath. Did you feel it? Flynn asked again. I looked down, warily at the objects. I did. It had been a surge of power, a, a terrible surge of power. And? Can you tell me a little more? You inherited them from your father. Did... Did you have any idea where he might have acquired them from? Flint lit another cigarette from the end of the one he was still smoking. No, uh, no. My father was a corporate lawyer, lobbyist over in DC, making sure oil companies could do whatever they want, and 
and the, the fat cats don't have to pay too much in taxes. I have no fucking clue how we ended up with these uh, magical nuts or whatever the hell they are. I hadn't expected a straightforward answer as to the origin of the testicles, and I hadn't received one. No matter. Uh, I'd like to offer you $100,000 cash in exchange for these two items. My offer had an obvious effect on the young man. A measure of focus and vitality appeared to come over him for the first time since I'd been there. This was clouded over quickly with a look of suspicion. A hundred K? For these balls? What the fuck are they, OP? I told him the truth. I don't know. They clearly possess a power of sorts unlike anything I've ever experienced. That power makes them valuable. Frankly, they're worth considerably more on the market than what I'm offering, but in order to collect on their true value, you need to know where to find the market, and I suspect that you don't. Flint considered briefly before coming back with his own truth. I just want them out of my life. They're awful. Yes, I accept your offer. Wonderful. I just need to run down to my car. I'll come straight back with a contract and your money. No problem, said Flint. He looked genuinely relieved now, as though his nerves had unwound several degrees. Even his hair seemed to settle down a touch. I exited the apartment, walked down the stairs, and pushed open the door to the apartment complex, stepping into the cool Vermont spring. As I made for my car, I wondered again if I was being prudent. It's not too late to hop in and drive back across state lines, I reminded myself, shuddering at the recollection of the terrible power I had experienced. But while I was frightened of that mysterious force, I was equally driven by a desire to know it. So, I opened up my trunk and retrieved the contract and the satchel of money. My decision had been made, and as I tread back up the stairs to the apartment complex, I kept at bay the awful premonition of doom that was tickling at the back of my skull. You are a professional, I reminded myself, wiping my brow with the back of my hand. It was wet sweat despite the chill in the air. Before I was quite aware of it, I found myself again knocking on the door to Flint's apartment. OP? Came his voice from the other side. Wasn't sure you'd be back. Yeah, come on in, buddy. It's open. I shifted the documents to the hand carrying the satchel, turned the knob, and swung the door open. I couldn't see Flint anywhere, so I took a step in, called his name. I heard the door creak closed and turn, just in time to see that Flint had been standing behind it and was now swinging a fist at me. I heard a crack a split second before the nerves in my face delivered the pain message to my brain, and then my head snapped back from the impact. I didn't have a chance to recover my footing. As Flint threw another punch into my nose, I toppled over backwards, the satchel flying out of my hand and onto the way down. I began to scream out for help, but my opponent cut my scream short by landing a blow directly into my windpipe. Then I was on the ground, and he was on top of me, pummeling me with both fists. I saw mostly shocks of color, blotted out reality. But at the same point, I noticed that he was clenching a testicle in each hand. They're mine! He screamed as he smashed against the side of my head. My ears began to ring, but I could hear him still, yelling with maniacal fervor. Mine! I was thrown into a chaotic death panic as a flood of various pain sensations assaulted me. Through some kind of instinct, I reached into my pocket and found the knife there. As I felt life slipping away from me, I pulled the knife out, flipped the blade open, and plunged it into Flint's side. I saw him grimace, but he kept beating me with full vigor. I stabbed him again, and again, and then one more time. And then I was out. When I opened my eyes, it was the utmost pain, and I was gazing blurrily up at the ceiling. My mind was blank for a moment, but f for the acknowledgement that I was in agony all over, next came the memory of Flint assaulting me in a terrifying flash. He didn't kill me. But did I kill him? I noticed that I was lying on a bed. I propped myself up on my elbows, groaning at the effort. I was in a bedroom, strewn with dirty laundry and half-empty dishes. Then I heard approaching footsteps and hurriedly reached in my pocket. But my knife wasn't there. Oh, you're up, said Flint, stepping into the doorframe, holding my blade in one hand. He had apparently taken off his shirt, cut it into strips, and wrapped it around his wounds. A red blotch on the fabric indicated the general area in which I had stabbed him. Yeah, listen, man, this is a fucked up situation we're in here. Uh, you have to know that 
That wasn't me that flipped out on you, right? That was the balls. <laughs> I, I wanted one more look at him before I sold him, you know, so I, I went over, I picked him up, and then um, that's why I did it. You know that, right? My brain wasn't at full or even quarter capacity, but I, I believed him. If he'd meant to kill me, he could have killed me. Instead of bringing me to his bed, my throat indicated that it was still too sore to produce words, so I simply nodded. Good. Yeah, you stabbed me. I didn't know how many times, but man, I didn't even really feel it at first. I just went right into beating your ass. But it got to me eventually, so I dropped the goddamn balls and grabbed my side, and as soon as I did, I was back to normal. You see? I nodded. It was the balls. I nodded again. So, what do we do now? I mean, I don't blame you for stabbing me. I was straight beating your ass to death. I don't blame you for that at all, and you can't blame me for beating your ass because it was the balls, and you know, that's, th there's all that money in the living room, and I, I could have taken that, I could have run, but I didn't. Do you see? I nodded. So best thing to do, I figure, is you take your money and go home, and I keep these goddamn fucking balls from hell, and we pretend this never happened, right? Unless, unless you want to help me destroy these things. I shook my head. Fine, fine, fine. Uh, fair enough. Dude, fair enough. Uh, just take your money and go. I shook my head again. What? What then? I pointed to myself, reached into my pocket, and pretended to bring something out. I opened an invisible wallet, pulled out an invisible stack of money, waved the pretend money in Flint's direction, then pointed at him. Then at his groin. Finally, I pointed at myself again. You... Wait. You you still want to buy these things? I nodded. Two hours later, after a shower, a pot of coffee, a few painkillers, and an exchange of goods sanctified by the signing of a contract, I was driving back home. A bit unsteadily, to be sure, but a jelly jar containing two severed and mysterious testicles in the passenger seat beside me. I suppose that without further explanation, few will understand why I purchased the testicles, despite knowing the danger lurking within them. Some will think that the testicles compelled me, but this wasn't so. I made my utmost decision without their influence. Others will think that it was because I was insane, or perhaps simply foolish. That may well be the case, but I did have my reasons, or if not reasons exactly, then let's call it intuition. While it was always possible that the power of the testicles was merely to make their possessors extremely aggressive and a bit of self-preservation, in my experience, objects of unknown qualities always contained depth beyond what they appeared at first glance. I therefore placed a bet on the possibility that the testicles contained untold powers, that had not yet been seen. Admittedly, I was indifferent at the time as to whether these powers would be destructive or not. To learn more about my purchase, I began research on the two fronts. First, I dredged up everything I could find about Flint's father, hoping to discover the origin of the mysterious artifacts. This path led to little new information. It was just as Flint had described, his father had been a lobbyist for major oil firms. I was able to extract a few names, major players in the Saudi Arabian government, as it turned out. To look at more in depth, but inevitably ran into impenetrable firewalls that left me dead-ended. Still, I kept these lines of research open, including keeping tabs on Flint, in case there was anything to be gleaned from it. The other avenue that I took was first-hand experimentation. This was more fruitful than I could have hoped for, and allowed me a glimpse of the incredible potential contained within these testicles. In my study, there is a bookcase that, with the proper movement of mechanisms, swings open to reveal a hidden room. This is my meditation room. There's no reason for it to be hidden other than some esoteric feeling that it grants me of being beyond the mundane world. It was here that I began my exploration of the testicles in earnest. I took them, still in the jelly jar, into my meditation room and sealed the door behind me. There I sat, cross-legged on my rug in the darkness, and unscrewed the lid of the jar. I plucked out the mysterious items, 
held one in each hand, and closed my eyes. At once I felt a surge of power run through my limbs as though I was preparing for a fight. My eyes were shut, but my other senses were suddenly at extra human attention. I could hear the hum of my kitchen refrigerator, which was downstairs, all the way in the opposite corner of my house. I could smell what was inside it as well, so long as I focused on a moment to separate out the odors. My, my flesh detected every draft in the house, and I could, I could picture their origins clearly in my mind as though looking at a map. It took all of my will to stay seated. My body was urging me to stand up and move around, perhaps to search for some hidden intruder that my heightened senses had overlooked. In fact, I did stand up many times, and it took several sessions before I was able to remain still. For a long time, nothing else happened. I repeated the ritual each evening after my other work was completed, determined that there was more to the testicles than my mundane senses could detect. I sat for hours on end, growing stiff and sore, battling as best I could against the agitation urging me to mobilize bodily against some imaginary threat that might be lurking out there. One night I was rewarded for my efforts. I began to see an image in my mind. It was of a yellow, flickering light, and as the image focused, it appeared to be the mouth of a cave, viewed at an angle with a blazing fire inside. All around the entrance to this cave was a vast, endless darkness. I found myself to be there, embodied, took a step closer, eager and apprehensive, in equal measure to see what, if anything, was lurking within. As soon as I did so, the image was gone completely, and I was left with nothing but the inside of my eyelids and the humming of the refrigerator somewhere below me. I was able to get a little closer to the cave the next evening, and a little closer the evening after that. With each step, my sense of wonder increased, and so too did my sense of dread. There was something unimaginably powerful inside of that cave. I understood that in my cells. Perhaps somewhere deeper than that, and, and it both thrilled me and terrified me. The further I got in my meditations, the more my body paid the price. What seemed like a few minutes in my trance state was hours in the physical world. I would often find myself, in the morning at first, and in the afternoon as I progressed, still sitting there in my secret room, now soiled and weak with hunger. It got to the point where I was neglecting too many of my other responsibilities, and so I was forced to take a couple of days off from my routine. And those days were painful, as if withdrawing from a drug. I was indeed shaking uncontrollably on the first day, absent from the testicles and running a high fever. By afternoon, I was vomiting blood. I hoped that I wouldn't lose my progress and need to start all over again, but also felt that I couldn't keep going without refreshing my body and my connection to the mundane world. On the third day without meditation, I decided to check up on Flint, something that I hadn't done for a week. If I couldn't pursue knowledge of the testicles directly, I suppose that I, I could still make progress on other fronts. Flint, I quickly discovered through a cursory search, had been brutally murdered in his apartment on the previous day by an unknown assailant, or possibly multiple assailants. After following up with some contacts, I was able to learn the details of his demise. He had been found dead, tied to a chair in his living room. His face had been brutally beaten. All ten of his fingers had been cut off and were left in a puddle of various bodily fluids that had gathered at his feet. Perhaps worst of all, his disembodied testicles had found their way to rest in the graveyard of his digits. The discovery led me to a renewed volley of vomit without ceremony. After my stomach had settled in a spell, the implications hit me more fully. Somebody was after the testicles. The sale of which Flint had documentation of, with my name on it. And this meant there would not be long before they would come after me. I deal in artifacts that are often beyond the measure of money, and so have invested a great deal in top-of-the-line security systems. I spent the rest of the day in contact with the company that serviced the system, ordering an inspection to ensure that everything was working properly, as well as 
a detail of work to watch my house for a few days with their own eyes. Still, I didn't feel safe. After analyzing it a thousand ways, the inescapable conclusion was that whoever had tortured and slaughtered Flint had known not only about the existence of the testicles, but had very likely known much more about the properties and origins of them than I did. Why else take such extreme measures to acquire them? I was at a distinct disadvantage despite my elaborate security measures. In my experience, knowledge truly was a weapon, and I had nearly none of it while my opponent apparently had it in spades. There was, however, one circumstance that I suppose might level the playing field a bit, namely that I had possession of the testicles and might be able to employ them in my defense, if only I knew their secret a little more. Thus I found myself returning to my meditation chamber that evening. Despite the knowledge that my body was not yet adequate for the mission of delving deeper into the testicles, I needed several more days of rest, I knew, and I knew that my opponent would not afford me those days. I had to act and place all of my bodily resources on the hope that I would be able to accomplish in one evening what I had not been able to achieve in the previous weeks leading up to the crisis. Liquor blunts focus, but lends courage, and of the two qualities, both of which were requisite to the task in front of me. I was far more deficient on the latter, and so before unlocking my secret room, I fortified myself with a tumbler full of a very fine, unique liquor, distilled with water from polar ice that an appreciative client had once gifted me. So, emboldened, I entered my room and withdrew the testicles from the jar. Far from leaving me out of practice as I had feared, my respite had made me much more receptive to the power of the testicles. Nearly as soon as I closed my eyes, I found myself a few short steps from the entrance to the cave. I could feel the heat from the fire within, though I still couldn't see what was inside. A voice issued from the cave and resounded without recognizable timber in the center of my mind. Come. It is time. I felt at last prepared to meet the mystery, as terrible as it might be, head on. Just as I took a step forward in this otherworldly place, my senses detected something alarming happening in the ordinary world. There were intruders on my property. I heard them creep upon the parked cars of the security detail, lure the guards out and slit their throats in the night. There were four of them, I discerned, and they were nearly silent, but not silent enough to evade my senses. Focus, commanded the entity inside my cave. Come. My body tensed as the intruder began picking the lock by my front door. After a moment, I heard the click of the lock coming undone, and the beep of the control panel indicating that the intruders had 45 seconds to enter the security code. Focus. Come. I took another step towards the cave. I was now technically inside of it, with the entity lurking just around a slight bend. The intruders below me didn't bother with the control panel. They were apparently unconcerned with the police, likely figured that they would be in and out before anybody arrived, or worse, that they could dispatch any officers in the same way they had eliminated my private security guards. Focus. Come. It was no easy matter. Every fiber of my body was screaming to mobilize against the real-world threat that was now creeping through my living room towards my staircase. Soon enough, I realized with terror, the thudding of my pulse would grow so thunderous as to drown out even my supernatural sense of hearing, and I would lose track of my opponents and be at, at even greater disadvantage. But this proved to be a foolish worry as the house alarm began to blare, drowning out all of the sounds. Focus. Come. In the cave, the force of gravity, it seemed, had grown a hundredfold and it felt like moving through something solid, but I forced myself onward, around the bend, until I saw the mysterious entity, standing as tall as me. It was a quivering, flaming, erect penis. What? What are you? There is God, and there is the God that made him. Then there is me, who made the first God. What you see is not my true form, which would melt your brain into a puddle. 
I fell to my knees, weeping. I did not doubt that the entity's true form was beyond my ability to comprehend. The form that was before me stretched my mind to its limits, assaulting it with both a beauty and ugliness that I hadn't thought possible, nor could I adequately describe. Are these yours? I asked, holding the testicles up. Everything is mine. In particular, those balls are the only remaining relics from the fourth era on the third earth and were only hung between the legs of the leader of the second humanity. Ah, what a violent disaster that experiment was. It was wonderful. You lot are awful, but nowhere near as delightfully terrible as second humanity. Just one of them could have, and would have, gladly wiped out your entire species if you looked at him funny. I gave them the sacred flame, and predictably, they eventually used it to destroy Third Earth completely. Back in the physical world, above the ringing alarm, I could hear the clatter of books falling from my bookshelf. Somehow, the intruder knew exactly where I was. If you don't wield the sacred flame yourself, quickly now, I am afraid they will fall into the hands of your house guests, who are very educated and very evil. Men, who are they? They are the ones who are going to kill you, unless you act now. What do I do? Summon the flame. How? You know how. Just picture it in your mind. With that, the divine entity in the guise of an enormous penis vanished, leaving me alone in the darkness. No, not alone. A sliver of light crept into the chamber as the intruders began to open my secret door. My body was too weak and exhausted to move. I watched helplessly as they entered, one by one, dressed in black robes, wearing ancient-style grotesque masks, one of them leveling a crossbow at the center of my forehead and releasing an arrow. I clenched down from the testicles and prepared to die. The arrow, I thought, is right now being burned out of existence by the sacred flame. It doesn't exist, and it never existed, and it has been reduced to less than ash. And then it happened. The arrow burst into flame when its tip was an inch away from my skull and disappeared into nothingness. Three of my assailants turned to run out of the room while the fourth aimed a gun at my head. It lit them all on fire at the same time and then they were gone. With them went the sound of the blaring alarm because they never existed. And so never set it off. My strength drained entirely. I crumpled to the floor in a catatonic state, not quite asleep, but certainly not awake. It's been a week since I discovered the true power of the testicles, and I haven't touched them since. They sit in a jar on a table next to the bed where I've been recovering ever since. The young man, Flint, who sold the artifact to me, is alive, if not well. His killers never existed, and so, quite simply, never killed him. I phoned him yesterday, and he sounded deep in his cup. I'm not in a good place mentally. But he is alive, and I intend to provide him whatever help I can, seeing as we share a bond over the testicles. I have, in fact, offered him a position as my assistant. He's considering my offer. Meanwhile, I've decided not to put the testicles up for sale. They're too powerful. I'm deeply uncomfortable having them around, but it seems as though the role of their guardian has fallen squarely on my shoulders. I have no doubt that others will come for them. I'll not hesitate to erase those would-be thieves with the sacred flame. Other than that, I am attempting to move on with my life. My algorithm has just alerted me of something potentially interesting. It's no rest for the curious, and that's how it ought to be. Yours, OP. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just want to make sure that all of you guys are still staying safe and doing your best to stay inside and keep yourself quarantined if you can do so. For those of you who can't, really appreciate you guys doing what you, you know, have to do. So, all the best to all of you who are still working, 
and all the best to all of you who are forced to kind of stay home and are not able to work. If you guys are missing out on a lot of the conventions, which at this point, all of them that I was planning on going to this year with the exception of San Japan, uh, looks like have been either canceled or pushed back. If you guys were looking forward to any of the conventions this year and are missing out on a lot of the artwork from some of your favorite authors or artists, take a look in the description down below. At least until the quarantine is over, you'll be able to find links to a bunch of my artist friends as well as authors uh, in the description of every video. And of course, I will be bringing you guys stories every single day from now until the end of time, available here on YouTube as well as here on the podcast on Spotify, Apple, iTunes, and Google, and wherever else you can get podcasts. And now a very special thank you, big thank you, the biggest thank you I can possibly give to all of you who support on patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, who help keep the lights on in my house. Patreons such as... Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Chompinski, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, G Weevil 3, Diana Kraus, Stephen Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, Nico Cow, The Ginger Bros, Dante Rao, Rafael Rodriguez, Last Blade Song, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Steampunk Center, Caleb Dougal, Daniel Paulson, Sky Harbor, The Homeless Bird 93, Gabrielle Undefined, Barbie Carmen, Liam Newman, Aaron Stormcrow, Dr. Strawberry, Barbara Masio, Thomas Burgett, Azazel Rotten, Let's Get Scared, S-Man, Brandy Hassanori, and King DDD. Thank you guys so much for supporting on Patreon, as well as all of you that are shown in the description down below. And sweet dreams, everyone.